back pacified it, that they can do anything they didn't want to do. We might not be back. I might be in jail. I might be anywhere. But when I leave, you can remember I said with the last words on my lips that I am a revolutionary. Hey everyone, welcome to the R Wisconsin Revolution podcast. My name is Andre Walton, and joining me today is Will Walter. How you doing today, Will? I'm doing well, Andre. It's always good to talk with you. Awesome, that's great. Uh, Glad to have you on again. Uh, So today we're talking about disaffected youth in America and the political implications they may have going forward. Now, us millennials and Gen Zers have a tough road ahead of us. We have a looming coronavirus recession, a climate catastrophe on the horizon, and an unfortunate political outcome in the near future. Every year, our elders tell us how important it is to vote. However, the more we've been engaged, the more we've been faced with contempt and condescension. We we yell for a Green New Deal, and we're told it's not doable. We ask for a $15 minimum wage, and we're told to find a better job rather than ask for the government's help. We ask for health care, and we're told that it can't be done because of the cost. I believe my generation wants to be involved in politics, but when we get involved and see no results from those who tell us to get involved, how can they be angry with us when we sit out of the political discourse? It's not that you don't want to be involved. It's that the youth believe that their voice is unheard. Millennials today only hold 3 to 5% of America's wealth. In contrast, boomers around the same age range held nearly 20% of the economic wealth. Millennials also make up 21% of the voting electorate and overwhelmingly in favor of progressive policy. Yet little to none of the policies uh, you support get through in Congress. What I'm saying is the political and economic balance of this country is out of whack. And until we address this situation, more and more youth are going to feel disaffected in our current system. Now, Will, you're a millennial as well. What is your take on the current economic system and political system and how it treats um, our youth today? Well, it's uh, the youth is clearly at uh, at a bit of a crossroads here. Like you said, we have been told election after election after election. Oh, well, you just need to, you know, fall in line and vote for for the establishment candidate this one last time. And we can push progressivism next election, because if you don't vote for our candidate this time, you know, the big bad boogeyman Republican candidate's going to come in and ruin everything, which is in a way accurate, yes, but it doesn't cover the entire picture of the fact. Uh, the fact being that you know both parties in the end are catering to the same wealthy donors. One party is just slightly nicer about it. If the Democrats really wanted to go out and earn progressive votes, like they seem to be saying that they want to do, they would support progressive policies that we are seeing in polling are exorbitantly popular with the vast majority of Democrats, let alone just, you know, the, the young demographics, something like Medicare for all, 87% approval, legalization of marijuana, 85%, a Green New Deal, 75%. That's not just support amongst, you know, young voters in particular, that's, that's support with all voters of the Democratic base. And to, to so blatantly ignore the will of the constituency is, frankly, it's it's evil and it goes against everything that that a democracy is supposed to represent and i don't really know why so many of these blue no matter who and uh you know the blue mega as as a lot of us may refer to them as i don't know why they are so incapable of understanding this they are they've been brainwashed as well to uh to the neoliberal corporatism of of the American duopoly and until the young people actually have their ideas and their opinions not just heard you know I'm so sick of oh we hear you you know we hear you but then not actually doing anything about it then no you don't you're just trying to placate us with uh, generic as hell platitudes that will make us shut up and fall in line instead of actually doing what we need to do to implement real change so it's it's a really sad uh, kind of event horizon we're facing here with so many massive issues coming to a head right now that the youth want to change and the youth want to to be at the forefront of improving these issues for, for the globe, but those who actually have power don't. 
Exactly. And I think we can definitely see that in the way the youth vote as well. Just a quick uh, kind of uh, express expression of how youth vote. Uh, we can look at how the Michigan uh, exit polls looked from the years of 18 to 29 year olds. Bernie Sanders garnered 76 percent of, of the vote compared to Joe Biden's 19 uh, from 30 year olds to 44 year olds. Bernie Sanders got 52 to 42 over Biden. And if you look at 65 and over, he got 70 or Biden won 71 to 20 versus Sander, Sanders. And, I, and the reason why I want to point that out is because I, I believe there is a tale of two political systems that we're living in. We have the older generation who uh, just believes in, you know, holding the status quo, because if we want to be honest, they already got their financial and economic um, rewards. They uh are not worried about economic standings and our generation we're worried about our economic standings many of us cannot afford to buy a home many of us can't afford to buy a house and we can't afford to take on any more ex extra debt considering most of us are swimming in student debt at this moment i think what we need to do right now is to find a way to get the older generation to listen to us and and, and hear us because at, at this point right now, it's more about holding the current economic system together rather than progressing the current economic system together. Uh, what is your thoughts on... I, th I think they hear yeah. us. They're just not listening to right. us, if that makes sense. You know, like, they're, uh, they're sitting around saying, like, well, the youth want to be heard. Okay, so let's have a nice little meeting where we all get together and let them talk and then... When we're done listening to them talk, we'll we'll say, oh, yeah, great ideas. We hear you. We'll try to implement that. And then as soon as that conversation ends, it's, okay, well, we're not doing any of that. We can't do any of that. We don't want to do any of that. Whatever. So they're not actually listening to what we're saying. They're simply, you know, hearing the words in one ear, out the other ear. None of it's, none of it's registering. I think they are so ingrained in their way of life that they don't understand some of the socioeconomic reasons behind why America was so uh, prosperous in their in their youth and they seem to think that oh well if if we were doing that great then why can't we do that now with you know the the post world war 2 boom for example american manufacturing was at was the powerhouse of the planet all of europe was completely destroyed and had to be rebuilt from scratch america wasn't even touched so of course the American middle class would boom because as a country, we had so many, so much of the global resources coming through us that we could afford to have this massive middle class. Now, these same people, as their wealth has accumulated over the years, and they've, you know, they're not filthy rich by any means, but they're comfortable. They, they have, they never have to worry about where their next meal is going to come from. You know, they can go retire to a nice beachfront property in Florida. They're taking, you know, cruises once a year for their family vacation or whatever it might be. They think that that because they are middle class and they were able to enjoy these amenities, that everybody who's quote unquote middle class should be able to do that. And they think that anybody who has this, a similar career arc that they had should therefore be middle class because they were. And a lot of these people in particular, you know, uh, I'll use a personal example of mine. My, my grandfather was middle, had a middle class lifestyle, was able to afford anything and everything he could want on one worker, one, uh, you know, my grandmother stayed at home, managed to put four kids through college, still had the boat to, to take out and hang out on the lake and whatever. And that was without a college degree to, to tell someone in the modern world, hey, you don't have a college degree, now go make a middle-class career is is just so absurd when you consider the fact that pretty much everybody that does have a college degree anyways is still unable to make a middle-class lifestyle. So I think they're, they don't understand a lot of the other factors that were going on in the world that led to uh, the American middle-class prosperity of that time frame, and they seem to think it can just be repeated when these same factors are not at hand all of american manufacturing has been shipped overseas that wasn't done by millennials that was done by the wealthy capitalists who wanted to save their bottom line 
And it's, so these jobs, you know, they no longer exist. How are you supposed to have this middle class lifestyle on these, you know, infinite jobs that are supposedly growing anywhere when these jobs that are good enough to sustain that middle class lifestyle are no longer here? I hear so many of the older people, oh, we'll just walk down the street. You can get a job anywhere. Sure, you can go get a job anywhere. But if you're going to be a, a cashier at McDonald's for 40 hours a week, you're not going to be able to live a middle class lifestyle. And they don't understand that these good jobs that allow that kind of lifestyle do not exist anymore. Exactly. And I think the way we, you know, frame it has to be different than it's currently being framed. Because one of the things the right usually uses to kind of talk about what's going on or how the economic um system is working they they use the stock market and then they use the unemployment rate well very few of americans actually have money in the stock market and the unemployment rate is mm -hmm. very misleading mm -hmm. you can literally technically by definition have uh, zero unemployment but yet people can be making two dollars an hour that doesn't make it mean that people are well off in their economic security and one of the things that i have a problem with is that Okay, like you like you just stated. Well, if you just go get a job, things would be just fine. Well, under Obama, after the economic recession, uh, to point that out, we have we're going through a second recession for millennials. Um, yes, jobs did come back, but most of these were you know part time jobs, gig jobs, being an Uber and things like that. And that technically means that you're gonna have to work two to three jobs just to make it even low middle class. So, I mean, we're put in a situation where we're, we're hit with student debt crisis. We have been hit with the 2009 um, housing crisis. We're about to get hit with a Corona crisis where it's not being addressed. Um, nobody wants to give any stimulus. Um, it's just, it's just a recipe for disaster. And then when things actually do happen, they're going to blame us to say, because, Oh, we were lazy and, and, and didn't want to go out to get a job. Yeah, it's really easy to get a job in the middle of a crisis. <laughs> I think the, the the better point that I like to make a lot of times to kind of counter the unemployment is the underemployment rate, which in March before the you know pandemic really started shutting everything down, the underemployment rate in America was 47%. That means almost one out of every two Americans held a job that they were overqualified for. And that just goes to show, you know, education is incredibly valuable. I, I think some people would look at that and say, oh, well, we're educating people too much. Okay, that, that doesn't exist. <laughs> I don't want to be a part of a society that thinks overeducation is a problem. I want as many people to be as educated as possible because the more educated you are, the better you can understand the circumstances around your life and the life of, of those you spend time with, how you can understand why situations happen, why they play out like they do. Um, so we have all of these educated workers, but we don't have enough what would be high skill or high education jobs to go around for these workers. So, you know, somebody with a, with a doctorate degree that has to work as a, I mean, this would be a bad example, but has, you know, some generic job that just requires a bachelor's degree, right? Well, this person has a doctorate degree because this job is highly wanted. It's highly competitive. So a lot of people are competing for this job. You have to be able to stand out. So you go and get more education. You now have your doctorate's degree, which allows you to stand out over the other people who just have a, a regular bachelor's degree. So you get this job that only required a regular bachelor's degree. Well, now you're using someone's labor who, as a doctor of knowledge, they could be out doing something very valuable. They could be out changing the world. Instead, they have to do this generic job because it's the only one that they were able to land or the only one they could find. As automation begins taking over a large percentage of uh, the American workforce availability, why are we punishing people for technology advancing to the point where their job isn't necessary? I mean, the, somehow the ultra-rich capitalist class has taught human beings that work is life and work is your entire value and your career is, is your identity. And that's frankly disgusting. In the, in the grand scheme of things, we sh human beings should be able to enjoy their time on earth. They should be able to do what they want to do in order to, to live as free as possible, right? That would be freedom is doing what you want to do. It's, it's not freedom 
if you have to go spend 50 to 60 to 70 hours of your week every single week slaving away at somebody for somebody else's company while they make $10 on every $1 you make or whatever. That's not freedom. And it's disgusting that so many people have bought into this mindset that work is life and work will set you free. And it, I believe that was literally the, the phrase on at the entrance to Auschwitz was work will set you free. It, it I see so many glaring similarities between the rise of uh, Nazism and the rise of fascism in Europe and America right now. We as a nation, we as a species, we as a, as a society are advancing to the point where we can have robots and other automated uh, pieces of technology doing jobs for us. The point of that from the very get-go, the point of, of creating machines to help human beings was so that humans wouldn't have to do the work that we didn't want to do. So now that we have machines capable of doing the work that we don't want to do, why are you punishing people who used to do that work? It's I think it's kind of embarrassing to be the wealthiest nation in the history of, of humanity and not be able to, at a bare minimum, provide the necessities required for a human being to survive. If you're an American citizen, the American government should provide whatever you need to simply stay alive. That means food, that means shelter, that means you know water, that whatever. The bare minimum, we will keep you alive. And I'm not saying now that you know, oh, well, then nobody will work. Everybody will be freeloaders. That's not true at all. There are people who do enjoy working, and those who enjoy working should be re rewarded for the work that they put in. Now, whether that means, you know, if you want to enjoy some of the luxuries that American society has to offer, yes, then you need to have a job. You need to be participating in society or, or whatever it may be. But so many so many people just think that, oh, socialism, you know, they're coming to take my money and to give it to all the poor and stuff. Well, as a society, we have the money to take care of everyone. We're not saying that you're, you know, upper middle class white suburban dad who's making $100,000 a year. They're not going to come take 80% of his paycheck. And I know a lot of people who do th seem to think that that's like the socialist mantra. We, we're talking about the guys that are making $13 billion in one day. People that have more money than they could ever spend in a thousand lifetimes. These are the ones who should be distributing their money for the use of society as a whole because without society allowing them to be in that position, they wouldn't be as wealthy as they currently are. They, the ultra-rich have way, way too much power, and until the working class is able to unite against that, I mean, we're only going to, to pull further and further into this Orwellian dystopia that we seem to find ourselves in today. Exactly. And in many cases, a lot of these one percenters are rich, actually got rich off of government contracts. But that's another conversation. But I want to pivot to um, another statistic that has to do with the wealth gap. So the millennial wealth gap between, you know, boomers, for example, is already pretty steep. But it gets even worse when you look at the millennium wealth gap between um, people of different racial ethnicity ethnicities. For example, millennial. If you're a white millennial, uh, the average or the medium, um, the medium wealth is twenty six thousand dollars. If you're Latinx, it's fourteen thousand dollars, and if you're black, it's a little bit over fifty five hundred dollars. And the reason why I want to point this out is because if these current, you know, ranges in in wealth continue, um, it's a pretty stark outlook for the future because. This means that there's going to be less home ownership for the black communities and minority communities overall. Overall, it's, they're going to have um, less uh, investment in businesses in the black communities and minority communities overall. And there's just going to be less money put in education. Basically, where I'm trying to get at is that it's going to be this endless cycle because one of the things that happens in the black community and the Latinx community and the minority communities is there's no investment and there's no money for education, all the social services that are needed. And if these current wealth disparities continue, that situation is just going to get worse. Um, if you think the education crisis in the, in the black communities is bad now, just wait 20 years from now when um, the, the, until the, Betsy DeVos has her way and every school in America is privatized. Exactly. And we'll see. Yeah. Exactly. And I just believe that this is a very scary statistic because 
if we look at history and look at how the the rules are written in favor of those with connections and power, uh, we can see a very, very poor situation for the minority communities in this country, even worse than it is now. And um, I just think that we need to um, actually do something about this legislatively uh, before things get worse, because we already see right now the coronavirus is hidden. The minority communities the worst. Um, I believe Latinx people are getting hit worse with the coronavirus because they work those close-in jobs. They work at hotels. They work at the... They're the you know, essential jobs. Exactly. exactly. So I think um, right now it's it's just a race to the bottom and the survival of the fittest. And it's it's all about who has the connections and who has the wealth. And cl- clearly right now it's it's quite obvious with, with the looming crisis that we're going through. The irony of the whole situation is that it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. A lot of the, you know, middle class and wealthy elite white people have this mindset that, you know, oh, well, maybe black people or Latinx people aren't working as hard or they're not getting as good of education, so they're not able to then contribute as much without realizing that they are directly responsible for some of that, uh, you know, fall back from an education standpoint. Like you said, it's it's cyclical. The entire... The entire concept, we see itself repeating itself over and over and over again. Home value, you live in a community with with relatively high um, home value, so they have higher property taxes. The property taxes generate more money to go to the local schools. The local schools have better funding. Better funded schools are able to teach students better, prepare them better for the future. This then allows the students to get into better, uh, higher education schools, get a better education in that regard, go out into the real world, make more money. So if you're in a poor area that doesn't have the kind of um, opportunities afforded to some of these wealthier suburban schools, your, your school just doesn't have the funding to, to properly take care of all the students, which means that, A, a lot of students that would have been incredibly successful, incredibly well-versed participants of society that could have changed the world, how many are just being you know ignored in, in some inner city school that doesn't have the ability to, to kind of let them flourish, if that makes sense. Um, so these, these schools then don't have funding, so the, the students aren't able to get the education they require, so they can't go out to college and get you know their, their degree, and then they can't turn it into a, a good job in the working world. Therefore, they're not making very much money, so they, they will live in a community where the home value is lower, and it just repeats itself over and over and over again. And uh, a lot of this issue in particular, I think, with Milwaukee as a great example is that we are so segregated. So many of, of uh, the living communities are by race. And therefore, when you have a, a, when you have specific communities that we know who lives there from a uh, racial demographic, those, the powers that be can then create less value out of surrounding areas or whatever it might be. You know, you're not going to send, um, the, new, the brand new Olive Garden that just got built in, built in the upper middle class white suburban neighborhood. You, it's an attraction now to, to that can generate money, that provides jobs, whatever it may be. They wouldn't build that in a community that didn't have as many resources available. And so it kind of, you see it's repeating itself over and over and over again as a means to, I think, control minorities, frankly, because I think a lot of uh, the ultra rich, the ultra wealthy, powerful elite still do have some deep ingrained racial issues and it's kind of scary because I don't know if we're going to be able to get over that anytime soon. So many young people are over that, but then, you know, the, the wealthy children of the powerful that have grown up in households where they've had racism kind of ingrained in them. They're the ones that have the money that have the power that have the connections that have the opportunities growing up. So if they just, you know, fill in the shoes of their father or whatever it might be on, on the, on the grand podium of, of societal control, then nothing will ever change. And I just can't understand why so many people don't recognize that poverty is the single greatest cause of crime. It, and it goes beyond racial disparity. If you look at some of the incredibly poor white people, neighborhoods in um, you know in the deep south or wherever it might be they have high crime rates too crime tends to equate more with poverty than anything else 
So if we are able to improve the living standards of some of these communities so that they're not fighting over resources with their fellow communities, in, uh, especially their fellow communities of color, you can get rid of a lot of the issues that these communities are facing. They're, not, they're no longer going to have to go out and, and worry about where their next meal is so they can afford to teach their kid about some concept that they might be passionate about whether it's electrical engineering, plumbing, you know, maybe they like spacecrafts. Before, you needed them to go out and get a job the day they turned 14 because they had to provide for the house or whatever it might be. Well, we'll say 16. Now they can follow their passions because they have this, this opportunity to kind of get out, to find an escape. We see that a lot with sports in particular. A lot of athletes will say that, you know, basketball or football or baseball or whatever was their escape from from the – crushing socioeconomic situation that their family might have been in. Why can't we do that with education of other kind? Why can't, why does it have to be that you're so physically talented that we'll give you this opportunity to advance out of, out of your shitty situation? Why can't it be that you're really, really good with numbers? So we're going to train you to be a mathematician because I think in the end, the wealthy and powerful, it's everything in existence is about them. They want these, these athletes are nothing more than, you know, they're just uh, just like the Ro Roman gladiators. They they want the athletes to be seen, not heard. Go out and play your sport, dribble your ball, and let me watch you and enjoy how physically talented you are. But I don't care about making the situations that you came for any better. And it's it's really messed up. It is. And the scary part about all of this in the end is that we have two candidates in November who are, in my opinion, are completely unequipped to handle this crisis. On one hand, we have Donald Trump, who is a complete fascist, who he doesn't care about anything to help the economically poor. Um, you know, the only thing he's really done is put through one stimulus check, and that really hasn't done anything. It's come and gone. And on the other hand, you have Joe Biden, who is full of half measures. And, for example, we have coronavirus going on, and his answer to... Uh, to the coronavirus crisis is somewhat of a public option, but to overall just strengthen Obamacare. Even with Obamacare, 45,000 people he died He literally a year. said he would veto Medicare for all. Exactly. Even with the situation, even with Obamacare, 45,000 people die a year because of the lack of health care. And then we have a student debt crisis. He said he would have public free tuition for anyone who's making under $125,000 a year. Um, and for those who already have college debt after 20 years of paying your debt, then you will actually be relieved of your college debt. To me, that's none of that is equipped to handle this because that means 20 years in 20 years, people are still going to be scared to buy houses. People are still going to be scared to buy cars and it's just going to stagnate the economy. And what we are facing is that we have nowhere to go and no one to address the concerns of this society. And we're told that we have to vote for the lesser of two evils. And we have to do this because if we don't, our survival is at risk. You guys already put our survival at risk. We're already facing a climate crisis. We're already facing a health crisis. We're already facing every crisis you can think of and imagine. And yet we're the ones who are going to be to blame if somebody doesn't win. I don't know. I'm a little bit frustrated overall. But I think that um, the whole situation is is set up for us to lose at this point in time. We're and set up to fail, yeah. It, and exactly. then when we do, they, they're just going to blame us. Yep, pretty much. It's your fault. Should have voted. I think another point um, that we didn't, uh, that we, uh, didn't touch on was um, even more than with 20 years of debt, you know, you're not getting your car, you're not getting your house. What What's the bigger thing that kind of comes from that, that I see a lot of boomers complaining about is you're not going to have children. You, If you can't afford to take care of yourself, why would you want to bring a child into this world, which is why we've seen the birth rate in America completely plummet. Exactly. Now, I don't know if this is done on purpose by the wealthy elite because they want to curb the numbers of non-wealthy elite people you know like oh well we can keep having kids because we can afford it but we want them to all be so poor that they can't i mean the, they know that the strength of 
the working class is our numbers. So maybe they're thinking, oh, well, if we cut their numbers down, they won't be able to overthrow us. But then you're not going to have people to do the work that needs to get done. Oh, well, then automation will take care of that. All right, if that's the plan you want to take, go for it. But when, you know, when the rest of the of the planet is starting to severely suffer because of all the, uh, you know, nefarious activity that you're doing behind the scenes, don't be surprised when they show up at your door with pitchforks and guillotines, because that's eventually going to happen if they're, if you don't want to allow us to, to, uh, you know, have a peaceful revolution, then a violent revolt will be the only other option. Exactly. And in conclusion... I believe that we do have the opportunity to fix this situation. I do see a lot of political energy out there for the youth in this country. Um, the protests right now are a huge, huge uh, sign of people being involved. We have the Sunrise Movement who are fighting for climate justice. We have political candidates running for office. It's not all bad. But my point is is that we have to work together to ensure the survival of this country. And right now, it's not about the survival of this country. It's about holding the status quo in order. And that's just how it is right now. But I think we can actually fix that. But it's going to take a lot of work and very fast because we don't have much time. Um, is there anything else you want to say, Will? I mean, you hit the nail on the head right there. We're running out of time. I hear a lot of people who want to, who are saying incremental change, you know, little by little, little by little, Rome wasn't built in a day. That is accurate, but what they're not telling us is that there's a massive uh, asteroid that's about to hit Rome. So if Rome isn't prepared for it, it doesn't matter if we've already built, we're going to, we're going to be destroyed. That asteroid, of course, being uh, climate change. If, if we're not prepared for this situation, we are going to, completely eliminate potentially human life on earth and i don't think that not only are are we not starting to be prepared but we haven't even begun planning to be prepared and it really is it's terrifying when when you think about how fast this potential ecological disaster is coming and how little we are doing to prepare for it exactly well that pretty much wraps it up Thank you, everybody, for joining the Our Wisconsin Revolution podcast, and we will catch you later. Have a good one, everybody. Take it easy. So we say we always say the Black Panther Party, that they can do anything they want to do. We might not be back. I'm